Hi guys, it's Janet. I'm here with Living Room Talks and I'm going to let our speakers introduce themselves. Hey, uh, I'm Courtney Grayson. I'm here at Walton High School. Um, just going to more detail, right, Janet? Just kind of go into my background a little bit. Yes, ma'am. Uh, grew up in Orlando, Florida, went to the University of Florida for undergrad. Um, after undergrad, I went to North Florida for grad school. I did my master's in public health. Um, I did want to stay in the college game for a little bit. So I went immediately after undergrad to get my, um, my master's. Didn't want to do it in athletic training from hearing from my older peers to kind of expand my educational background. So I did it in public health. Um, after that, I was exposed to Kennesaw State University, which was in the same conference as UNF, which is where I did my grad work. I uh, knew somebody up here. Once the job kind of came open and I had finished my graduate degree, I ended up coming up to Kennesaw State and was there for nine years where I met Tony, um, and then Tony is kind of my connection where I'm now at, at Walton High School. How's everybody doing? Tony Hunter, uh, head athletic trainer here at Walton High School currently. Um, born and raised from Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, been all over the country, literally. Uh, did my undergrad at Minnesota State up in Mankato. Uh, moved down to Indiana, did my grad at Ball State, and worked my way all the way over to Oregon uh, to do my fellowship at Oregon State. And uh, kind of like, like Courtney said, I met her at Kennesaw State, so moving from Oregon all the way down to Georgia. So for me, kind of sounds like an ar army brat to a certain extent, but I've definitely been all over the country uh, and it's been a great experience. So did some years at uh, Kennesaw State, helping uh, Philip Young out and um, assisting uh, their football team, which is actually very successful at uh, Kennesaw. Um, but I got four kids, don't want to leave this out. My wife and four kids is actually probably one of the major reasons why I left Kennesaw State. Kennesaw State was a great place, great staff, but uh, it took a lot of time away from my family. A lot of time away from my family. Still repping that KSU. Right? <laughs> so uh, I had to make a big decision uh, that actually wasn't more, it was more of a personal decision uh, versus professional. I had to make a decision that was going to benefit my family more, but still also gave me an opportunity to do what I love. And so far, I've been down here going on four years now. Very fortunate situation, and I can't complain at all. So it's been interesting to me talking to athletic trainers that are working in the secondary school setting with all the current events going on. How's it been like with your students, and what type of conversations have you had recently? You know, for the most part, um, I will say uh, it's been going pretty well in our community. Um, I think, you know, going on this summer when there was a lot of tension, right? Uh, I think we had a couple coaches take on a great leadership role in regards to engaging with their students. Uh, they actually had a big podcast early this summer where they brought on some families, uh, not just the student athletes, but also brought on some parents to kind of discuss some things. And I thought that was a really great approach. Uh, to kind of hear how the parents feel within this community. And I thought they was very candid. I thought they was very transparent um, and truthful, you know, and I, I thought it was really good for our community here. Our community is uh, maybe considered a white collar community. Uh, there's a lot of families that make some pretty good amount of money in this community. Uh, our, our community here is a little bit more predominantly white as well. Uh, so I thought that podcast was great. Uh, for me personally here, there hasn't been a lot of conversation here within our sports med facility uh, with a lot of our student athletes, uh, but I'm always here and always willing to be a ear uh, for any of our student athletes who need that. I don't know if you've had any different experience, Courtney. We've had a few more, um, you know, I get a different kind of exposure to the athletes, uh, to Tony, because we're here on the nitty gritty a little bit more, but he gets a lot of the classroom side. Um, I think in the beginning, it was just a lot of frustration, but that's a lot of frustration from anybody, right? But I think our kids really accepted the changes regardless, because at the end of the day, everybody just wanted to play sports. So, you know, whenever you had an unruly kid, you just kind of check them, like, do you want to play football or not? Like, this is what the new requirement is. So in the sense, shut up, do your job, and let's move on. Um, because you can sit here and complain about it, or you can just kind of get on the train like everybody else and, and, and work hard and, 
and figure out and navigate just like everybody else has to navigate. How have you guys been with your personal feelings with everything that's going on in politics and race relations? It's a big question, Janet. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, again, we were just talking about politics. I, I don't like politics at all. It's very challenging area for me to grasp. Um, so for me, I, I, I definitely stay in tune with it to kind of get a good grasp of what's going on, uh, to, to at least know who's running things, whether it's from a local, state, or national level. Um, but I'm just not a fan of politics. I just don't like where America is going with politics. Um, and I just, yeah, so I, 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 don't, I don't mind discussing it, um, but I'm not, like overly opinionated about it. In regards to the COVID, man, I, I always tell people, man, my professional and personal views about it conflict so hard uh, in regards to COVID. Uh, because reason why personally, because my faith is what drives me from a personal standpoint. So where I stand in faith supersedes even the science, you know, but that's just me personally. So uh, from a professional standpoint, we gotta do what we gotta do. Uh, CDC comes out with guidelines, Department of Health come out with guidelines as a healthcare provider, we got to follow. I, I, I don't think there's no question to that. And I think we got to do the best that we can to try to minimize our student athletes, uh, you know, risk of exposure. And I think, you know, our policies and procedures need to be written up and followed so that we can mitigate uh, the spread. Simple as that. I don't think we can stop the spread, uh, but I do think we have to mitigate it as best as we can. So that's pretty straightforward for me, you know, overseeing, you know, uh, our, our department is just making sure we're following policy procedures and making sure that we're following CDC guidelines. Because as healthcare providers, at the end of the day, from a liability and legal standpoint, if we're not following it, we're in trouble. So I, I just don't think that's no question. But on a personal level, you know, you come over to my house. If you ain't sick, you ain't sick. You know, I just I ask that you operate with integrity. You operate with honesty. If you're not sick, you're obviously a close friend, family member. I don't mind you coming over. You know, and you know, some people say, "Well, should you be wearing a mask?" I I, I say, "Well, if you're gonna eat my food, <laughs> I'll let you decide if you want to wear a mask." And that's just all honesty. Like, if you're willing to sit down and eat the food that we're gonna prepare, I don't know if wearing a mask is gonna prevent anything else. So if you're comfortable coming over, you're comfortable eating my food, you're more welcome to stay in my house without a mask. We're still not going to be on top of each other. We're still going to respect our social distance, but I don't mind, you know, the interaction. Uh, and Tony and I, we talk about this, I feel like a good amount of the time, uh, is that I do differ from Tony in, in many, many ways, but we always seem to have really down-to-earth conversations that aren't rude or anything which you wish the rest of America <laughs> would partake in. Uh, in contrast to Tony, I actually like the science a lot and I believe in the science. Um, not believe in the science, but I, I, I'm more attentive to the science component, I should say. I think that's more of an appropriate terminology. Uh, with the public health masters, right, numbers and statistics and data, it's kind of what I grew up on, if that makes sense. So I actually look at NPR every day and I look at to see what the COVID numbers are. I like being informed. I like knowing the information. I like knowing my concern versus my non, like I kind of just, that's how my brain works. So in that regard, uh, that's kind of where Tony and I differ. Um, I think we're the same way though, in regards to being at home. If, if I believe I've been doing everything I can to be responsible, and I believe Tony has, and we, I mean, we're at work every day. We almost consider, I don't know how you do it. I consider him in my bubble because at the end of the day, we're with each other so daggone much that um, I may see you a little bit more than my husband, but not, <laughs> it's like Christmas break excluded. But, you know, so it's one of those things like we are naturally together so much. It's one of those things like if he has it, I'm probably going to have it anyway and vice versa because we are so close. Um, so we do spend a lot of time together, even outside of, of work. But 
At the same time, I think that we're doing everything that we need to by the CDC here. So, you know, it's one of those things like if I'm doing everything that I'm doing and I still get it, I don't know what else I could have done. Um, so you kind of just take it with a grain of salt and you move on by faith and just go, hopefully it's not going to be bad. Hopefully I can control my symptoms. Hopefully, you know, it's not going to be too whatever. And then you move on. And then um, on the politics side, I like being engaged. I like observing politics. I don't like being engaged in politics. I think that's a different kind of component. Like I'm not going to enter any, any talks or any forums, but I'm going to read all the comments. <laughs> So oh, I, do, I do watch the news. Um, my husband hates it. Like he can't stand the fact that I have CNN on at any point. I like knowing the information. I was just literally telling Tony, I vote consistently um, for the sake of, I know it may not always quote unquote matter. And you say matter in a loose term, right? People say, oh, my vote doesn't matter. Oh, it does matter. Sometimes when you live in a really skew area it don't matter <laughs> especially if, if your opinions are different but at the end of the day to me if i did nothing and i still complain then i should shut the hell up so in my mind as long as i'm doing what i can in order to try to influence what i want if it still doesn't work out i can't say i didn't do anything so that's kind of my mindset and you know what's that saying it's better to know your your enemy what did we say the other day Oh man, now you're asking me. Uh, you definitely want to. You want to have your enemies closer than your friends. Right. You know? So to me, that right in politics, I want to know at least as much about my enemies as possible because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. I want to know where they stand. I want to know what kind of people they are, and that's the biggest thing right now with politics. Is I don't like the kind of people we have. I don't care what they what they want to vote on. Right. Everybody's got their own opinion. Tony and I are going to vote on the same things the same way. But just like he picks us based on character, if your character is shit, like I don't want you representing the world, nor my community, nor my family. So that's basically what I vote on. And just to add, uh, I, I know there was the racial uh, topic. I mean, at the end of the day, it's been unfortunate throughout this year. Uh, obviously, a lot of things have been caught on video camera, um, you know, a lot of deaths that I think were wrong uh, especially towards our race um so at the end of the day i mean have, having cameras out there things are more exposed and uh so i think you know the world is able to see some things that probably been going on for a pretty good amount you know uh, generation after generation uh but the question for me is just how do we move forward like i'm yes i, I got four kids uh, I was talking to a group of people probably about a month ago, and uh, there was that gentleman who was at the door of his car, and I apologize that I don't remember his name, but I remember that video pretty clear. Uh, but he was at the door of his car, and his kids were in the, in the vehicle, and he got shot in the back. And, um, you know, when I watched that video, I watched it several times, and I probably shouldn't have. But the reason why that video bothered me more, and not saying all these other videos wasn't, you know, but the reason why it bothered me is because I got kids too. So that would hit home to me a lot more than anything. And I'm sure that that man probably had a, I don't know what, you know, if I can remember that man probably had a record. It doesn't matter. You know, if I'm in front of my kids, you know, and um, to, I, I can only imagine feeling the heat go through my back. And knowing in that moment as I'm losing my breath, as I'm losing life, my kids are watching that. And that bothered me. And that actually had me teared up a little bit, you know, because th this that's not how life should be, you know. So, and it's tough, you know, my oldest child is eight and everybody asks, you know, what are you gonna talk to your kids about and so forth. And people know me, I'm a very transparent guy. Even with Christmas, I was just talking to Courtney, from the time my kids asked about Christmas, Santa Claus was never in the picture. There was there was no such thing as Santa Claus to my kids, okay? Uh, my kids, if we're gonna provide them presents, they need to know that the presents is from us. Uh, but even with this, like when it's time to actually start having these conversations with my kids, that's, that's tough to know that I gotta have these conversations. And we gonna have them, but I gotta have them. And to know that I might have, you know, 
other, you know, my white counterparts or just other race groups not necessarily have to have those conversations because their kids don't have to go through those situations. Um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, I've always known it's been different. It was always been racial issues. The question is, is when is it going to change? And I know we're, you know, trying to be dependent on the system, you know, and voting and so forth. So, you know, civil, civil rights, civil laws and stuff. Yeah. I know those can help, but at the end of the day, it's the condition of every man's heart, you know, that needs to change. And the question is, is how do we affect that? You know, even on the George Floyd, and this, I'll, I'll stop here on this one, but this is my viewpoint. People talk about defunding the police and changing, you know, their training. Well, that training had nothing to do with that. You know, that, that cop wasn't trained to kill somebody. That cop wasn't trained to sit there on the person's head and the neck, you know, until that person died. That training had nothing to do with the condition of that cop's heart. So maybe the hiring system needs to change. I don't know, but it ain't, it ain't the training. It's us as people, you know, that, that we have to change. So uh, I don't have an answer for it. I really don't. But all I know is for the people who connect with me, I can continue to show love, share love, be a light, and hopefully my light continues to spread across the world, however it spreads, and we continue to move from there. So I'm gonna make like the weirdest right turn right now and talk about athletic training. So <laughs> obviously we're all minorities on this call right now, and then we're healthcare providers that puts us even in a smaller minority group. Have you two ever felt that you were treated differently as the healthcare provider or as the voice of sports medicine? So for me, you know, here in Georgia, less, you know, but I, I say for me, I, I wouldn't feel like I was treated differently, whether it be from a patient, whether it be from a coworker. Uh, I, you know, I don't really feel like I had any true racial issues. I think, well, not think, I know I've always experienced some microaggression circumstances from time to time, but nothing that I haven't been built up as a person to be able to deal with. And at the end of the day, I've learned what battles I need to fight to fight. And then I've also learned what battles that I can move forward with and things be okay. Uh, but I've definitely always dealt with some microaggression from time to time. But outside of that, I feel like personally, I've been able to do what I came to do as an athletic trainer. Um, I was telling Tony this, reviewing your, your question sheet, um, I think, and kind of the more I think about it, the way that I kind of came into athletic training, I think worked in my benefit. I came from college, worked at another college for grad school with um, track athletes. So I had a very diverse background with track and field. And then we got into kind of soccer and, and softball. And then when I came up to here from Florida to Kennesaw and I worked at Kennesaw State for, for a good couple of years, I worked with men's basketball, women's soccer, women's lacrosse, um, and obviously around all other sports. But in the college setting, you don't really get that a lot, right? Because you're dealing with usually a very diverse background. Um, it helped being in Atlanta as well, right? Because it's just a very diverse city in general, even if it's not just black, there's Asian, there's East Indian, you know, uh, Latino, Hispanic, however we want to describe them. Um, unfortunately, I don't know what's PC. Um, but we had such a unique background at the college anyway that it never really felt isolated. Uh, I think just like Tony said, I had microaggressions, but they weren't based, based on my job and my performance. It was based on life circumstances and things that people would see in the community, but it didn't directly impact me and my ability to do my job or anybody's trust in my ability to do my job. And so I think by the time I got to Walton High School, I'm a little bit older, um, I think a little bit more keen on my evaluation skills, a little bit more keen on my communication skills and, and how I present myself to physicians and parents. So a little more polished in that sense, so I don't, it, it never presented to me in that way that my race ever had anything to do with any conversation I may have had with a parent. Um, so if there has been, it's never been blatant to me. 
Um, I don't feel like I've ever been treated differently because of my race or my appearance. Because if you look at me, a lot of people don't know what I am. They don't know if I'm black. They don't know if I'm Spanish. They don't know if I'm, um, you know, Caribbean, Dominican, Puerto Rican. They don't know it. My, I have a cultural background of the Caribbean and, and, uh, and black, but people, you know, your color, period. <laughs> it's like, once you have any kind of color on your skin, you're just something and they don't know what that is. But I've never really been treated in a way that I felt I was being different or being treated differently by the people I directly work with. Now you'll hear privileged comments, you'll hear things that don't really apply, you know, where you kind of go, oh man, that's your white privilege not understanding the situation and the context. But it's still, again, nothing directly related to me. It's mostly about something on the radio or something happening socially or even COVID-19. And, and you're like, yeah, I understand it's not affecting you as much, but there's a whole lot of black people dying. So like, it was one of those things, like it's usually the context of things that are outside, but not directly me. The biggest thing I get is you're light skin. You don't look black. You don't talk black. You don't act black. Da, 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 da. But that has nothing to do with how I've been able to treat people professionally. And I just echo what she said. She articulated that a lot better than I did. <laughs> women have a way of doing that. I'm just, I'm just starting. <laughs> so, um, so in the secondary school setting, as athletic trainers in the upcoming years, what issues do you think athletic trainers are going to face in the secondary school setting? I mean, I feel like we're already facing it, you know, and I've been talking about this for the past couple of weeks, months probably, uh, but just the, the burnout, you know, you have too many school settings where you have one athletic trainer at the school. And at the end of the day, we're set up to triage injuries and to address emergency situations. That's not athletic training. That's not what we went to school for. So you have too many athletic trainers put in a situation where they can't operate as athletic trainers. They're actually operating as EMTs. Like they're there to make sure nobody dies. They're there to make sure your injury, you know, is referred to the right uh, healthcare provider or right physician. That's it. So the issues that we're dealing with, that needs to change. Uh, so one of the things, you know, that I'm a big advocate for is building sports medicine programs at the high school level versus just trying to put one athletic trainer at the high school level. Now, I do understand that by having one athletic trainer at a high school can, you know, decrease deaths at the high school level, secondary school level, right? By having an athletic trainer there, all these cardiac arrest issues, these heart attack issues, any issues, heat illness, right? All these type of issues, by having an athletic trainer there, I do think that we can decrease, okay, those types of death, right? I'm not going to say we're stopping it. So I don't, I'm, you know, that's, that's definitely not the case. There's no guarantees. Uh, so I, I understand having one athletic trainer, but as athletic trainers, that's not what we went to school for. We went to school learning what it means to operate within a sports medicine or athletic training program. Right. When we most of us went to a, at a collegiate setting, that's the only way you get your degree. And that's what we learned. We learned how to operate with physicians. We learned how to operate with other athletic trainers or other athlete, uh, other health care providers, PTs, chiropractors, nutritionists, dietitians. Right. Those all fall within the sports medicine umbrella. And that's what we need to encourage. That's what we need to advocate. And that's what we need to start for at the high school level. If not, you're going to continue to see athletic trainers burn out. And I do believe if we change and start that initiative, um, you know, you're going to see better care for our student athletes, right? When you can, if you can get three to four athletic trainers at East, East High School, for one, that helps share the burden, right? When I'm by myself, you take on all the burden and there's no, there's no stress relief. And people always say, well, what do you do to, well, you don't have time to even relieve stress when you're by yourself. But if I have a team, well, for one, we're bouncing ideas off each other. We're working as a team. If, if, this, if, if this person's struggling, we can share the burden. Yeah, we catch each other a lot more. Like if we know Tony's got a lot on his plate, 
but like go go do what you got to do and then come back when you're ready and they've done it to me and we've done it to our coworkers. so you learn to you learn to read your coworkers well right Courtney's having a tough time let's let her take care of whatever personal business she needs to and then the kids don't suffer because of it right if I was by myself and I'm having personal issues at home and I've got this and I got that and then I'm taking less care unfortunately or um because I mean naturally we're human right maybe our care diminishes on my kids side and then there's no lack of that anymore because we're all kind of reading each other bouncing each other and and you know uplifting each other or keeping each other safe <laughs> for sure so that's my biggest thing we're already dealing with the problem we got to get away from this one athletic trainer at each high school and we got to get away from this coverage model and transition to a care model with a sports medicine team. Uh, you know, I think there's something within my, I mean, how living room talk is this? <laughs> you're, you're not even in my living room right now. You're in my bedroom. So let's go. <laughs> so, so what I'm going to try to say it is given the way some models are with athletic trainers and how they provide coverage, it can restrict their abilities and their, uh, they're a little bit handcuffed as athletic trainers. Um, and coming from the collegiate setting and working with adults and coming in here and working with minors, I get it, they're minors. But at the end of the day, I'm still an athletic trainer and I shouldn't have to change so much of what I do as a clinician based on who's paying my bill if that makes sense. Um, you know, I, I went and I got all these certifications and I took all the coursework and I'm proficient at it, but there's certain things that I can't do because somebody doesn't want to take a liability risk for it. And you're like, if I have my own certification, I've been licensed, I've taken a course, I've done everything that I've needed to as a clinician in order to ensure that I can give this care, but they're like, now nah, we just don't want to do it because we're too scared about what might happen. So you're just like, it, you know, I, I get people so happy. I get people or this or that, but you're, you're literally making people tie their hand behind their back and do things. And you're just like, now when you restrict people and what they can do, that, that frustrates the community as well. Um, you look miserable. You're not really getting recruits. You're not getting kids that are like, she looks happy. <laughs> and you're like, mm -hmm. there's like all this stuff I would do, but I can't do it because my employer won't allow me. So we're going to send you somewhere else yep. to do the same exact thing. And I lose credibility, right? If I have to send you to PT because it's something I can't do, uh, you know, it's just like, are you serious? Like, Sorry guys, can't do that because I'm not allowed to because I'm a two-year-old and I have no, <laughs> you're just like, yep. nobody trusts me with the hot stove. Like that, <laughs> that's what it really feels like. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's a side note. Um, my biggest other side note is I can't stand this master's entry level program. Um, I think it's stupid. Uh, I think unless they're changing the dynamic of what we're learning to change it to a master's program, like I, I get, I get both sides of the story, but what you're doing is, is you're decreasing the ability for people to get it done in a timely fashion, in a financially reasonable fashion. And, and you're making it harder for people to want to desire to be athletic trainers. Um, I agree. I'm, I'm not a fan of the master's. Because if I think about my undergraduate career, what else would I have gotten a four-year degree in to then do this afterwards? I don't know. I feel like, you know, a basic biology degree would have been stupid. Um, I say, I mean, me personally, I think it would have been stupid. Kinesiology, I can kind of get it, right? But I, see, I think the same thing with PT. I think we've put two, I like trade school. I'm gonna say it again. I think trade schools are necessary. I think everybody doesn't need to go to college. I think college is an overblown system, and this is a whole side note, Janet. <laughs> it's like, I think colleges are stupid because all it does is try to give people to spend money, spend money, spend money on these student loans that they don't need. Um, I get it if we want basic knowledge, but I don't think everything needs to be uh, a four-year degree and a two-year professional degree. I think once you kind of establish the fact that you want to go into 
PT and healthcare and occupational like that just needs to be the course and then you you can you can pick the path wherever you want um, and if you want to stay in all the way to MD you stay all the way to MD if you want to cut off at this train or cut off at that train and cut off here like you should be able to split off wherever you desire and we put everything in this confine where it has to be this and it has to be that and then to me when you do that you, you lose a lot of people right because it's hard for somebody to go oh, I just finished my degree but now I got to find money to go pay for grad school because it's going to cost more money um because professional school is always more expensive than traditional uh then you have to have the motivation to go back to school so I didn't I didn't learn anything extra that I attributed to my degree in grad school right in back in the day I say back in the day it was like 10 years ago not even you just needed to get a master's so you could work in the collegiate setting and I knew I wanted to work in the collegiate setting, so I got a master's because of that. Didn't have anything to do with athletic training, right? And everybody I talked to that had gone to a master's athletic training program was like, it's the same two years, just you're doing a little bit different research. <laughs> you're like, so I'm going to learn everything I just learned again just to say I have a master's? No, I'm going to go do something different. So... For me, you're just like, it was already kind of a joke then to have a master's in athletic training six, seven years ago. It was no different. It was just a title that you had so that you could work in a setting. And then just like Tony said, you get burnout after a while and people end up leaving that and going to PA or PT because it's not worth it. And you're just like, now we're going to make it mandatory for people to go to a master's program. I don't know if, if what, they're, what they're trying to put value in works to try to uplift the profession as a whole. I don't know if I'm making it a master's program is the only way to do that. Courtney's stirring up the pot, y'all. I I'm just want y'all to know people go watch we this. We were talking one. about it the other day, and I can't stand it. It bothers me. Hey, people go watch this, they go be <laughs> upset. All those scholars don't, out there. Don't give out my email address, Jen. <laughs> like, All those. Let me go take my information down on the website, just because oh, I don't man. want any nasty. I'll add to it. Uh, we'd already ruffled some feathers uh, just <laughs> because of my association, but uh, it's all good though. Um, I, the, the challenge for me is, you know, one of the biggest things I hear with these the, uh, going this master route is the increase in pay, and I, I just I feel like there's a gap of understanding in regards to increase in pay because. I already got my master's, even, even though it's not a master of athletic training, I got my master's already. That didn't increase my pay. Because at the end of the day, if an institution has this amount allotted to pay their sports medicine providers, right? We got a team of 10 athletic trainers. We just had somebody leave the position. I have $40,000 to pay the next athletic trainer you can hire. If that director of sports medicine comes in and says, hey, this athletic trainer has a uh, master's in athletic training uh, and is looking to get paid 45, and the AD is like, no, I told you, I have $40,000 to pay this athletic trainer. That's it. They're not, if, if they don't have more money to pay, they're not going to pay more money. And I don't believe that all the hundreds and thousands of institutions that we have out here are going to sit here and say, hey, the athletic trainers just transitioned from bachelor's to master's. We need to make sure that we all get on board and start paying more money. Unfortunately, that is, that's not reality. Now, I do believe that, hey, some, not just institutions, some institutions, some organizations, okay, some companies will respect that. They will probably you know, because you have a master's, they probably will increase the pay, the, the offer that they provide. But I don't think us as a profession transitioning to a master's program is the true way of that. I think us as a profession actually educating our value and who we are as athletic trainers and what we bring to the table is what's actually going to increase our pay. Now, individually, some of us can do that very well, but I think as a profession in ATA, Okay, uh, your state, well, for us is GATA, whatever the case may be, I think them lobbying for us, them educating, okay. Consistent across the board? Across the board. Across the state lines? In regards to increased pay, but more importantly, showing our value. A lot of places don't have value for us. 
And that's why we still struggle. And if we cry out individually, sometimes that can be very difficult. But if we actually had a whole profession cry out and push a new agenda in regards to gaining respectable pay, I think that would actually make more of a difference. Tony and Courtney, the next couple of minutes are for you guys, your final statement. <laughs> what? Get started. what? About, I mean, I need guidance because, you know, I'm reckless. <laughs> Janet, uh, final statement about being a minority in general, I think is where I'm going to go. Um, as as crappy as things have been socially, as as many things as I hear, I think I've talked to Tony about this, that's going on, George Floyd, the guy in the car, all those things that happen, they're infuriating, they're frustrating, um, they're emotionally draining, they're disheartening, um, all of the above. But at the end of the day, I wouldn't change the color of my skin or my background for the life of me. I think it's made me a better person. I think it's made me more understanding to other people. Uh, to walk around with blinders, as some people in this world do, I'm like, y'all stupid. <laughs> you laughing. But like, seriously, like, is it a whole hell of a lot of work? Yes. Is it a whole hell of a lot frustrating? Yes. But I think the things that I gain as a human in this world and my compassion for others and everything else that comes with being a minority is far worth far better than being some white privileged prick that doesn't understand anybody else but himself and his own ego. So, or her ego, it doesn't matter. So to me, I'll take that any day and I'll repeat these stupid ass struggles over and over again, just to keep and maintain this perspective as a human being and to have compassion with others in this world. Man, final conclusion, final statement. <laughs> Deep, I, I, I know. I know, right? <laughs> it's like, try to hit um, that, Tony. No, I'm just joking. I mean, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, as, as a minority, we're we're always going to face challenges. You know, so the biggest thing is for me is community base. Uh, we all going to have burdens. Uh, we're all going to have some setbacks. We're going to have challenges. But one thing I've learned is if we come together as a community and we actually share those burdens, we can actually find ourselves progressing a lot faster. Mm -hmm. uh, so I recommend that for us all, you know, and that's what I've been trying to push in these past couple of weeks is just trying to build a community of, of connection, you know, just actually getting to know each other a little bit more as uh, ATs of color, um, continue to actually not just get to know each other, but truly build relationships with one another um, so that when times do get tough, we actually have each other to fall on. And I think that's the biggest thing. I think we all need to be very conscious and very aware of what's actually going on in our local communities and also what's going on in the nation. Um, and professionally. And, and professionally. Um, so yeah, for me, it, it, it's just about community. It's about fellowship. It's about continuing to show love with one another. But the biggest thing is if we learn how to actually work with one another, we actually learn how to give back to ourselves um, because, you know, what do they call it? Crabs in the bucket. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's, that's a natural tendency for people of color. Crabs in the bucket. If we can get rid of that motto and actually be able to get up to somewhere and then look down and reach down for our, for our people and pull them up as well, uh, if we can ever have that mentality, uh, people will be surprised of how powerful we are mm -hmm. and uh, how impactful we can be mm -hmm. and how much success we truly can gain. Um, and that's whether that's on a personal level, whether we're talking athletic training, whatever the case may be, that would be my advice for life. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time and I'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. Appreciate you.